Amen. Get your Bibles open to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I want to finish this up tonight about our motives, about motives and um, about our intentions and how we serve the Lord. And uh, I kind of just wanted to make a few things uh, uh, plain uh, and finish up this evening and, and, and our, our, our um, uh, Bible teaching on, on uh, you know, a lot of people, they don't serve the Lord because they think that their motives aren't, their motives aren't in the right place, so they never do anything for the Lord. Uh, and we talked about that in, in uh, a comparison to what the Bible says about obedience. The Bible says um, little about motives compared to the amount of what we're commanded to do through obedience. The Bible didn't tell us to go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to whatsoever I, uh, teaching them to do whatsoever I, uh, uh, commanded you. Whatsoever I commanded you. I'm, here I am messing up the scripture. I need, maybe I did take some Benadryl. I don't know. Um, uh, slowing me down a little bit. It didn't say to do it happy. It didn't say to do it with a glad heart and pure intentions and making sure God gets all the glory. It said go. Go. You know, when I tell my kids to do something, you know what? When I, usually it's Lucas and Houston because they're in that that Lucas closer to that preteen age in Houston, he's getting there, is when you give them a command, they do that like sulking thing. Like, mm, I don't want to do that. I don't care if you want to or not. Just do it. Do it well, why, because I told you to. I, and and this is, this is uh, Christians lose sight of the relationship we have with God. Get this. He is our father. We are his children and and we lose sight of the bible says keeping faith as a child coming to him as a child now what i want to read is first corinthians chapter 3 verse 11 through 15 and i want to talk i want to finish this tonight now the bible says for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is jesus christ now if any man build upon this foundation gold silver precious stones wood hay stubble Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it hath, uh, let's see, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Hmm. If any man's work abide which hath uh, built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Heavenly Father, bless our time tonight. This, this uh, short time we spend together on Sundays compared to the rest of the hours throughout the week, it's just a little bit of time to come back in here and, and um, try to re-energize, try to plug back in, try to juice back up, try to uh, clean out the system, so to speak, and, and fill up our tank again, or maybe desperately hear a word or, or something that we needed to hear that we've been looking through and asking throughout the week and and just somehow somebody at church or the preacher or a song or the announcements or somebody, something was said and somehow we were helped. Lord, thank you for the Holy Spirit of God and how you work. Bless our time tonight. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We talked about last night uh, or last week we got into, we got as far as um, uh, the body and uh, the, the tabernacle versus the temple and the wood, hay, stubble compared to gold, silver, precious stones. What are, what are those? What, what are those? And I always thought, to be honest with you, for, for, for such a long time, I just kind of left it up to chance. I just kind of said, you know what? I'm going to live my life. I'm going to live it the best that I can. I'm going to be obedient to mom and dad, and I'm going to uh, um, not fight with my brother anymore, and I'm not going to uh, beat up Jesse and Sarah anymore. And I'm not, actually, it was them beating me up. I'm not going to, I'm going to be a good brother. I'm going to be a good Christian as best I can. I'm going to stay in church, and I'm going to tithe, and I'm going to be in a ministry, and, and, and I'm going to just kind of do the best I can and, and just let it go from there. You know, just basically put the sails up and let the wind take me. Best I can, Right. Uh, but it, it's so much more than that. When, when you kind of, um, I like to say, put on your, your scuba suit and go, go deep diving into the Bible, you go down into the depths, you know. Uh, and, and when you really learn about uh, the parables and you really learn about some of these things, I really wanted to know what was wood, hay, stubble, what's gold, silver, precious stones? Because I'd like, I'd like to have nothing be lost, right? I want to get to heaven and not suffer any loss. I, that's not going to happen. 
uh, because I've already invested my life into wood, hay, stubble. But here, the neat thing is, is I can stop really putting a lot of my effort into wood, hay, stubble and start putting into gold, silver, precious stones. You say, okay, well, what's the difference? Basically, it's what you do on earth for earth and what you do on earth for heaven. The Bible says laying up treasure in heaven for yourself. The Bible, how do you do that? But seek ye first the kingdom of God. Let's say, um, let's say Lucas grows up and he becomes a very um, successful businessman, uh, a business mogul, Fortune 500 company. And um, uh, he's just, uh, he's very, very wealthy. He has generational money. Um, and um, uh, of course, he leaves an inheritance to his children, but he takes a, a, a great uh, 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 mass amount of his money and he leaves it to saving the sequoias. That's wood, hay, stubble. Literally, wood, wood. Uh, it's literally, it's wood, hay, stubble. Because he took what he did on earth and he used it for earth. And I'm, by the way, sequoias are impressive. You know what I'm talking about? Sequoia trees, the big redwood, they're beautiful. I, I want to take Jamie to see them so bad. I want to take Jamie out there and, and the boys and let them look up those giant trees and go, no way. They're, they're incredible. Um, and, and to see the West Coast and the, the, the waves crashing on the rocks in Oregon and the, the beautiful mountains. Anyway, anyway, we have a beautiful country. And, and I am all for preserving it. I don't like littering. I don't like um, uh, trashy neighborhoods. I don't like things that, because God gave us, a, 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 even in this sin-torn world, it's still beautiful. It's still beautiful. God made it. And God's going to make it again one day, and I'm, I'm excited for that. And, um, uh, but he, he takes what he did on earth, and he put his efforts into building these companies, and, and God blessed him and, and allowed him to, to thrive, and then he took what he was blessed with and used it for the whales and for um, the, um, to, to build a new Olympic swim pool at whatever university and to, um, uh, to, to help the city with uh, a project. That was done for earth. That's wood, hay, stubble. And I'm not saying, I'm not even condemning it. But when he gets to heaven, that will be laid on the altar and it will be tried by fire and it will be burned because it didn't last. But let's say that Lucas, same situation, he takes that money and he says, I'm going to give X amount to X amount of churches for the bus ministry, for missions, for track distribution. I'm going to help. Uh, I'm going to help that pastor go full time. I'm going to help that assistant pastor go full time. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to take this what I've been given and I'm going to put it into the ministry, and I'm going to put, I'm going to invest it into people who are doing eternal works and eternal things. That is doing what you can on earth for heaven. That's gold, silver, precious stones. Now, now that's a, just a very quick example, and there are, are many others that could go into that. Now, what I want to finish on, and we talked about uh, the temporal versus eternal, what will last, what won't, uh, 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 and um, how the, the, the judgment will go. But what I want to give you tonight is very quickly, I want to finish with this. Um, God promises, um, a, 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 how would you say, a perpetuity, which means it comes from the word perpetual, which means eternal or infinite. It's just perpetual. Um, uh, four, four specific things that um, I would like to mention. And um, I, I struggle I'm not chasing rabbits, Miss Jennifer. I'm, I'm staying right in. The... I struggle with knowing how to say things to people who are trying to find their way. And I'm not saying that I've got all, I'm not saying I have all the answers. But what I would like to do is just write a little, like, like we do tracks, I'd like to write a book like, hey, do you want to get your life on track? Do these things right here. Literally, jump in the deep end and watch and see if God won't make you float. Um, and for the Christian, it's um, be in church every time the doors are open. Tell somebody about Jesus. Tithe and get into ministry. If somebody would, inv if somebody who's just kind of, I'm trying to find my way. I'm trying to get some traction. If a Christian would go three to thrive, would tell somebody about Jesus consistently, like show up and go soul winning, tithe and get into ministry, it would it would change your life. You'd begin to get a grip, or, or, 
Oh, let, me, let me pull back. I need to add one. Read your Bible and pray every day. Devotions, are, 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 that's where it all starts. Because you can, you can Martha all you want, but if you're not, if you're not relationship like Mary did, then, then we'll eventually burn out. But God gives four things of perpetuity or perpetualness that if our lives, and I don't, listen, I, I would, I, I'd probably be the most miserable of all men if I was trying to be a pastor and trying to do all that I could do just to like save face and I didn't want to disappoint anybody and I didn't want to let anybody down and it meant hang all that. And I, I don't want to let anybody down and I'm not trying to save face. I want to live a life that's worthwhile. I want to live a life that like counts for something. I want to live a life that when I die, I hear well done thou good. If that's a possibility, I want to hear it. If first place is a possibility. You've got to understand that's something I want to strive for. I may not get it, but I want to get first place in my race. Now, are you going to get first place in your race? Or are you going to get last place? Well, well, that doesn't make any sense if I'm the only one running. Oh, you can disqualify yourself. Don't run a race that is disqualifiable. He is worthy to run for. He's worthy. God gives us these, these, these four things I'm going to give you very quickly that if we're going to live a life that's worthwhile, if I want my work, if I want my works to pass the, to pass the test that will be at the judgment seat of Christ, if I, if I want that, that heavenly flame that is going to rain down and, and, and engulf in flames the works of the life of Jake Jackson at the judgment seat of Christ, then I absolutely, and I think if, if I could put it into words, the right words, I must say then I must wrap myself up in the things that God counts worthy. So number one, number one, uh, the number one thing that I should wrap myself up is in, in and around is the Christian. The Christian. You say, what do you mean the Christian? I mean, invest your life in other Christians. Invest your life in other Christians. Invest it through the bus ministry. Invest it through the nursery. Invest it through the, uh, a homeless program at your church. Invest it through RU. Invest it through a jail ministry. Invest it through um, uh, 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 soul winning. Invest it through anything and everything that you can to create Christians and disciple Christians. Invest in Christians. Now, I got to tell you, every Christian that you come across is not, an invest, is not a wise investment. Um, but that's where Holy Spirit discernment comes in, and that's where um, wisdom comes in, and, and that's where experience comes in. Experience where you, where you, uh, uh, you, you are uh, very charitable, very helpful people, and how you have to take a step back and look at your hand and say, how many times have I been bit? Okay, what lesson am I going to learn here? Who to invest in? who to invest in, who not to invest in, or who to invest in up to a point. Who to say, okay, we have helped and we, can, we can't do anymore. Because if we continue to do for these folks, no telling how many folks we won't be able to do for. If we continue to help this this, this, I don't mean to put it this way, but if I continue to help this dog here who keeps biting my hand, and, it's, it, and it, what, it ha what happens is it becomes my will. They're going to get what I'm trying to give them. And I'm not that I am my dad's teacher in any way, shape, or form. But uh, he, we've bounced things off of each other before. And, 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 and I, I said this, Dad, growing up, and, and I saw how you tried to get people to just to get it. And they wouldn't get it. I said, I didn't have anything to do with it, and it frustrated me. <laughs> I'd sit around long enough. Listen, I used to be um, three, uh, 3218 North Clinton. Uh, Dad would be in the back office counseling people for hours. I'd, I'd be at church. Well, I wanted to ride home with them. I'd fall asleep on the back pew. And, and a lot of those people, they didn't do anything. They uh, uh, most of them amounted for nothing for God. Some of them did. But I liken that to the 10 lepers who were healed and only one came back and said, thank you. You're going to invest in people and give your best to people. Folks, don't ever give your best to people. Give your best to God. Then give your efforts to people. Give good effort to people. The Bible says, do unto others. How? As you would want done to you. 
Treat others how you would want treated. Give unto others how you would want given to. And, and be kind to people. But God says we're supposed to, I mean, the Bible is heavy, has heavy teaching on how our relationship with other Christians. Invest in other Christians. Invest in the next, un, un, um, and I don't mean this um, uh, 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 in any type of sexual way, in any way, shape, or form, but uh, uh, the perverted the perverted, the older you get, the more perverted the world makes you. Your mind is polluted. Your heart is, and perverted, it, it, it just means uh, defiled. It just means um, if I have a glass of water and I were to put bleach in it, that water just became perverted or polluted. That's, that's all that means. Uh, uh, but invest in youth. Invest in young people. Invest in people who you see that there is a hunger and thirst for righteousness. Number one, invest in Christians. Number two, invest your life in the King James Bible. Invest your life in the King James Bible. Now, I like Bibles. I, I think I have um, maybe a dozen. And I mean, that's from, uh, from being little up till now. I have a bunch of Bibles, and I have a bunch of boxes in the chapel that have books in it. I want to build a bookshelf and put books on it. And um, I have a couple of Bibles in there, and one of it's really nice, and it says that the on the front of it, beautiful leather, and it says, um, uh, the glory of children of their fathers. And Brother Dan tried to steal my Bible from me. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I see you. Wait, who's up there? What are you doing? Do you have a baby or something? Well, she didn't have a baby. She's holding a baby, yeah. right? <laughs> Please don't have a baby in the hallway. Um, it's just, this isn't the place. Um, but um, uh, invest your life in the Bible. Invest your life in the Bible. What does that mean? It means spend a whole lot more time in the Bible than you do in front of the television. It means spend a whole lot more time in the Bible, or at least thinking about the Bible. Now, I'm driving down the road. I can't read the Bible. You know what I can do? I can think on the Bible. I can think on it. And man, living in the day and age that we have, I can put headphones on or in and listen to the Bible and meditate on the Bible. Invest your time in the King James Bible. And let me tell you, don't get sidetracked. Don't even get, don't even, don't even get in the, don't even get in the argument chat rooms about is the King James Bible the King James Bible? Yes, the King James Bible is the Bible. It is the only English Bible for the English speaking people that is the Word of God. All the rest of them are. Not worth reading. No sense in being vulgar. They're not, they're junk. There was a, do you know the difference between the King James Bible that reads, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the Amplified Bible, the Amplified Bible reads like this. In the beginning was, <laughs> y'all get that? Amplified, I said that last week and a couple of people were like, <laughs> Amplified. I took the Amplified Bible and I threw it away. It, there's no sense in it, leaving it in here. There's no sense in it. There's no sense in it. It, it. it doesn't deserve to be put on a shelf and I'm not putting it in anybody's hand and I'm not finding the person that used to own it. It, do, it's, it doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to exist. Invest your life in the King James Bible. The Bible, the King James Bible is the only Bible. The King James Bible is the only Bible. You know that, Houston? Then what are you lipping over there? The King James Bible is the only Bible. It is the Word of God. That's it. That's it, man. The King James Bible is the only Bible. And the more that you think it, and the more that you say it, and the more that you believe it, and you'll, before you know it, it's something that you'll just stand on and be like, I've got an NIV. Nope, it's the King James Bible. I've got an ASV. It's the King James Bible. I know the King James Bible is the only Bible. And folks, if that's the Bible you got saved out of, stick with it. If that's the Bible that helped change your life, stick with it. The, <coughs> you, woo, the King James Bible, amen. The King James Bible. Number one, the Christian. The Christian, and invest in Christians. Number two, invest your life in the King James Bible. Read it. Uh, let me see what I have written in, in one of the front of my Bibles. Um, uh, I don't think it's this one. No, it's not. Um, learn it. Learn it. Love it. Live it. Learn it. Love it. Live it. Uh, and it will change your life. Number three, the church. The church. Everything that entails the church. Wrap yourself up in the church, God's uh, uh, body here on earth. When the Bible speaks of the church, it's not speaking about um, um, some universal or invisible thing. I, I can't stand when people say that. I just want to 
bless people with a holy prayer when they say, the, the church is, uh, we can meet anywhere. Uh, yeah, yes, we could. We, if the church burned down, we could meet out in, 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 the, in, the, in the, uh, the property over there. We could meet over in the building over there. We could find a place to rent. Uh, over in, uh, let's see, uh, um, some Russian parts of their country and some Ukraine parts of it, they, they, uh, uh, they make snow forts and they make benches out of snow. Some people get baptized in freezing temperatures. Why? Because that's where, that's all they have to meet. That's all they have. I know some uh, folks over in Africa, they meet in little huts. They meet under trees. Yes, I understand that the building is not the church. It's the body of Christ. But the, the Bible talks about the New Test, the local New Testament church and a place where we come to gather. A place where we come to gather. That is who we are. That's what we are. Now, I'm not talking about some invisible thing. I'm talking about what the Bible teaches as the local New Testament church. If it's, about, if it's of the church, get involved in it. If it's of the church, get involved in it. Tithe, go soul winning, get, about, get involved in a ministry. Do something, be a part of that ministry, that membership. You know, our, our one big problem with our, our society today is that we can be members of things without being involved in the thing. I can be a member of a gym and never go. I can be a member of a, um, of a, of a uh, are you a Big Lots member? Yep. <laughs> what does that mean? It means, I, listen, they ask for my phone number, the, the, the email when we go there. I don't, I don't it go straight to the trash folder. I don't, but you can get 20% off. I don't look, I don't pay attention. I don't look enough because I'm not interested in being a Big Lots member. It brings no real big value to my life. It doesn't. Uh, but there are some places that you're, if you're a member of, you are, you better contribute. Uh, like if you're a member, a team member of the New York Yankees, no, you're going to shave and you're going to look sharp and you're going to do what's right and you're going to dress a certain way. If you are a member of the NBA or the NFL or the MLB or the NHL or whatever it is, you're going, you're going to behave with this certain conduct or you're fined or you're suspended or you're expelled or you're, you're out. You're out. You can't be here. Um, somebody mentioned to me the other day, they said, hey, did you hear so-and-so said they were going to come back? I said, no, they're not. No, they are not. Well, and I thought to myself, I was thinking about it today. I'm like, is that the right stand? Yup. <laughs> because we haven't had an argument here. We haven't had a quarrel. We haven't had drama. We haven't, the Bible says, cast out the scorner and the, cease, and the strife will cease. And the simple will learn. Get rid of the scorner and watch contention disappear. Well, so-and-so was like, nope, not happening. If you're really changed, go find a church that you can show that you're really changed and you'd be a big blessing to them. But you're not coming here because it is my job to protect this place. God has made me the under-shepherd. It's my job to spot a wolf and to spot a scorner and to spot somebody who's causing a problem and say, hey, ship up or ship out because you cannot be a member here and act that way. You can't be a member here and do that. What are you doing? Uh, Planet Fitness, they allow, they, um, you can be a member there, but you're not allowed to be like a Gold's member type. But you can't go in there and just throw up four and 500 pounds all over the place. And what do they call it? I can't remember what they even call it. But basically, don't be a, a meathead. They don't want people there showing off. Please don't do that here. And if you continue to do that, you can't be a member here because you're making people uncomfortable with your strength. <laughs> now, granted, I'm, they never came up to me and said that. I was the person that complained about the person. Uh, they're showing off, you know. Uh, uh, but the, being a church member, being a member, invest your time in, in, in other Christians, invest your time in the Bible, invest your time and yourself in the church. And then number one, I, I don't have, I, 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 there's so much more history and learning that I need to do on this, but I know the Bible has a, that God has a special plan and it's still being played out in the nation of Israel. L folks, if America turns their back on Israel, don't you? Don't you? That's where Jesus Christ is going to set up his millennial kingdom. The, the people of Israel are still looking for a Messiah. He's already came, and he's coming back again. God has given a perpetual existent, existence to the Christian, to the Bible, his word, 
to the church, the body of believers, and to the nation of Israel. It's in prophecy. Now, the Bible says, um, uh, uh, kind of jump back into to our motives very quickly, and I'll tie all this together. The Bible doesn't say, um, uh, uh, it, you could you could pick up the man who prayed on the corner, and he prayed so everybody could see him. What were his motives, you know? But the Bible doesn't say much about motives in comparison to what it says about obedience. Obedience. Obey, obey, obey. The Bible says it's without faith, it is impossible to please him, but we're supposed to be obedience to that faith and that faithfulness, obedience to our faith. Now, there's a whole lot to say um, about um, uh, uh, did you do that instead of why did you do that? Why did you do that? Well, see, we get caught up in so, um, I may be using this off base, but the legalistic terms and the, and the traditions of men in our religion uh, and, and, and in Christianity of why did you do that? Why did you do that? Instead of did you do that? Did you do that? If you, if you would wake up every day and you would wake up every day and live your lives according to what you believe mom and dad wanted you to do and what God wanted you to do and what your teacher at school wanted you to do, you'd hear a whole lot less of why did you do that and, and more of did you do that? And we saw that you did that. And God, I don't want to stand before God and him say, why did you do that? And why did you do that? And why did you do that? I would rather hear, did you do that? Yes, check. Did you? Now, I know it won't work that way. But if God were to stand before me with his clipboard and, and a checklist and say, did you do that? Yes, check. Did you do that? Yes, check. And he'd check off the list instead of saying, Jackson, why'd you do that? And why'd you do that? I mean, why'd you do that? Um, folks, we're, we're, we're foolish if we... If we constantly say to ourselves, um, uh, uh, um, well, I better be careful. I better pause and make sure my motives are right instead of showing action. Folks, you can go out just barely making it through on your spiritual road. You're running your race and see people saved while this guy or this gal over here is sitting down winning nobody because they want to make sure their motives are right. Uh. Do what's right through obedience and your motives will eventually line up. Do what's right through obedience and your motives will eventually line up. Now, um, who, who said, um, uh, who was it? Basically, it was along the lines of um, uh, God will forgive you if you win souls for the wrong reason. Well, you know, I, we've had soul winning contests and bus programs and things like that. I didn't witness to everybody I've witnessed to for the glory of God before. I did it because I wanted to win a contest. But does that person, is that person still saved? If they said, dear God, I know I'm a sinner and I want to, I believe on Jesus. Yes, of course he is. My, did my motives stop him from getting saved? Did my motives stop him from hearing the, the, the word of God? No, they didn't. He still got saved. God wants us to be obedient and our motives will eventually line up. Now, I want to ask you this. Of course, it's rhetorical. You don't have to answer it. But what, do you think, what do you think makes God happier? A church who, ba a church who baptizes um, uh, two people with the right motives to make sure that God got all the glory or a church who, may, who, who baptized 6,000 people, 7,000 people, 500 people. And they did it because of contests and they did it because, of course, the Great Commission, but God, they didn't praise and hoop and holler and give God all the glory every single time one of those people got saved and baptized. Folks, when we get to heaven, God's going to get all the glory anyway. When we get to heaven, God's going to get all the glory. And, and the fact is, is what we can't give God all the glory right now anyway because we're people. We're human. I can't give God all the glory right now. I'm human. I don't know. I, I got to be honest with you. Sometimes people walk out and they say, preacher, that was a good message. You know what I do? I, I like praise just like anybody else does. But I don't go away going, I preached a good No, I, that's not my aim. Uh, um, and I know they say that if you admit that you're humble, that you're not humble. Uh, you know, that, that's, man, that's a catch-22 or something. And if you're, if you're humble and you say that you're humble, you're not really humble, man, that's, you can't get away with that. But uh, I, I thank the Lord so far, and I hope he keeps it that way, that he has not given me a, a big head. Um, I have nothing to lean on besides the Bible and a lot of prayer and a lot of, dear God, help. I don't have a diploma. I don't have... Um, some uh, uh, extravagant background to lean on. I have uh, the Lord and the Holy Spirit of God. That's all. Now, I'm always glad 
that people say, Brother Jackson, that was a good message, and thank you for that today, because I like praise just like everybody else. So it's not our motives that God's worried about. It's our works, the Bible says, and what sort they are. What sort of works did you do? He didn't say what sort and with what motive. He said what sort. What sort. Now, the determining factor of the judgment seat of Christ is going to be a matter of obedience and disobedience. Obedience and disobedience. And um, uh, when a Christian, such as uh, ourselves, when we get busy for God, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not important to begin with why you are doing what you're doing as much as it is, are you doing what you're doing? Or are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? Are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? You know, when you get hired in for a job, they don't care if you're there with the mindset to feed your family or to get rich. If you said that you, you filled out the application and you got hired down, they want you to show up on time, do your job, and do what's right, and don't cause problems, and don't cause damages to the company, and do what's right, and be an asset to the company. They don't care why you're there. You know, God, I don't believe God is so much concerned as to why you do what you do as long as you are doing what you are supposed to be doing. Because if you are living in, in, in the biblical um, a focal of obedience, it's the same God that you are obeying is the one that can work on your heart and change your motives. I don't think there's anybody truly that could be right with God and, and, and living in obedience with the word of God that stays prideful and stays a, a, a glory hog and stays pompous and stays big headed because the Bible says that he can take you up and, and put you back down. Because when we live in the full obedience of the Bible, we will be humble. We will in honor prefer one another. We will give glory to the Lord. So though I am saying, you're, I'm not saying your motives don't matter. I'm saying that they will fall into place as long as you get in your place, and your place is obedience. Uh, I remember hearing a story about a fellow one time who, who came, to the, he came to church, and um, uh, he just wasn't feeling right with God and didn't feel like he could come into the service. So he stayed out of the service and, and just read his Bible the whole time. Okay, I know I, his motives might have been good. His intentions might have been good. But he was supposed to be in with, the, with his brothers and sisters in Christ, assembled together, listening to the word of God, because something might have been said to him from his preacher, from his pastor, from his shepherd, that would have helped him. But instead, he, he went out on his own. He Good intentions, good intentions, but he, he wasn't where he was supposed to be. And a whole lot of people, they don't go soul. And a whole lot of people, they don't do what they're supposed to be doing. They don't ever serve the Lord because they don't feel like they're good enough to serve the Lord. Or they don't feel like their heart is right enough to serve the Lord. That your intent, put your intentions on the back burner and obey. Obey right away. Your, in, your motives will fix themselves. They'll, they'll fix themselves. It'll fall right into place. Um... So at the judgment seat of Christ, what, 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 what's, the, what's the determining factor? Obedience and disobedience. So when a Christian gets busy for God, it's important we ask ourselves, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? The thing that matters uh, is, is um, what we do. What we do, not necessarily how we do it. Now Paul says we, have, we should do it happily. We should do it with a good spirit and a good attitude. We should do it, not a frown on our face. We should do it with a smile. We should do it happily because we know who we're doing it for and why we're doing it. But last I checked, life is hard. And people get on your nerves. And people cut you off in traffic. And, husband and husbands and wives fight. And kids drive you crazy. And bills pile up faster than you can get them paid. It seems like the bills come rushing in and the pay to pay them comes trickling in. Tidal wave versus, um, uh, you know, a, a leaky faucet. And life is hard. So, of course, you're going to come in and be like, anybody ever came to church mad before, sad before, upset before, distressed before, distressed, in stress, upside down, perplexed and not knowing what to do? Yep, everybody could raise our hands. Health, wealth, friends, family, finance, stress, pressure. God. But you know what you did? You obeyed and assembled yourselves together. God didn't. God's, God was so far less uh, worried about why you came to church as much as he is, is did you go to church? Why'd you tithe? Well, I, I really wanted blessed. Okay, but did you tithe? Yes, Lord. Okay, that's all I'm interested in. I'm interested in obedience. 
Did you tell people about my son? Yes, sir, I did. Well, why'd you do it? Well, because we had a contest that your God doesn't care about your motives as much as he does your obedience. So let's be obedient to the Bible and let our motives work themselves out. So uh, uh, forget what people tell you. Forget what people have told you about your motives and, and, uh, uh, and, and your attitude toward things. I can't tell you how many times I've obeyed my mom and dad with a bad attitude, but I still did it. I still did it. Can't tell you how many times the coach said run laps or suicides or this stupid layup drill. It's a stinking layup. I, oh, I said stinking. Miss Pip, it seems every time you're here, I say stinking. Or maybe every time you're here, I catch it. Uh, and every time you're not here, I don't catch it. I don't know. Uh, uh, but run this. Oh, man, I don't want to do that. I've done that a thousand times. I don't want to do it again. I don't care if you like it or not. Do it. Lucas, he detests vacuuming. He hates to vacuum. You know who I call on to vacuum? Lucas, Luke, I want you to vacuum. Oh, oh, Dad, I hate vacuuming. I'm sorry you do a good job. <laughs> Dad, I don't want to vacuum. I know you don't, but I'm telling you to because I don't. Uh, <laughs> that's the great thing about kids. They're just little slaves for you, amen? Uh, do, what I, do what I tell you, not as I do. as I say, not as I do, amen? Uh, uh, but um, I tell Luke, Luke, I want you to vacuum. He is, ah, oh, I don't care if he did it with a, ah, oh, or a, all oh, right, hoo -hoo, yay, vacuum. I don't care what attitude he did it with, as long as he did it. As long as he did it. And to be honest with you, if he vacuumed long enough, if I made Lucas vacuum the house every single day, you know what would end up happening? He'd end up like vacuuming. Because he'd get good at it. He'd get creative with it. He'd like seeing the lines in the carpet. He'd like seeing a finished product. He'd like, something, he'd like to see something go from dirty to clean, and he'd end up liking it. And when I told Houston to vacuum, and Houston went in there and just kind of, mm -hmm, Lucas would be like, ah, give me that vacuum. I got to do this. You ever have to take a job from someone because they're doing a terrible job? Yeah, you too all the time. Yeah, me. Uh, uh, and you're like, no, I got to fix what you were doing. Come on, give me that thing, and you do it. You know, again, you do it. Why? Your motives will change themselves. If you do something long enough, your motives will change. And if we'll obey God long enough, it becomes not just habit where you do it like a drone or a robot or a zombie. I vow to follow God. No, you'll do it and you'll do it and know why you're doing it. Especially if you walk with God every day, your motives begin to fix themselves and change themselves. So quit worrying about your motives and quit worrying about everybody else's motives. I'd love for people, the Bible says, whatsoever thy hand find to do, do it as unto the Lord. I want to grab people all the time. Like, you know what you're doing? You're doing that for the Lord. You're doing it for the Lord, so do it like you're doing it for the Lord. People, all kinds of people are dying without Christ in their hearts, and they're going to hell forever and ever and ever and ever, and we're worried about people's motives. We don't have time to sit there and analyze and psychoanalyze and pull out all the, um, uh, what's the big thing they use in sports now? Uh, not algorithms, but what's the analytics. analytics, all the analytics of the Christian life and try to figure everybody out and plug everybody in right where they fit the best. We're not puzzle pieces. God can, he is the potter and we are the clay. He can make us into whatever he wants us to make us into. The thing is, is we all got to get in the boat together and start rowing together. Obey. Hey, you want to get from this side of the shore to that other side? Well, you got to obey the laws of physics and you got to propel that boat forward somehow. Grab an oar and start rowing. Hoist the sails, put them up in the air, and let the wind take us. We got to do something to get this boat from point A to point B. We have to obey the laws of whatever situation it may be. And God says, if you want the blessings and you want the peace that passes all understanding and you want me to be there in the darkest times and walk through the valley of the shadow, no, I'm going to do it because I said I would. I'm going to do it because I will do what I said I would do, whether you hold up to your end of the bargain or not. I'm going to be there with you. But there's real growth and you can become like Christ. Be like Christ if you'll obey what I have to tell you to obey. The Bible says that Christ was obedient to the cross are we obedient to our cross? Uh, there's a fella, uh, he's the nephew of Benny Hinn. His name was Costi, C-O-S-T-I, Costi Hinn. And that's what he was speaking about. We were watching something in, in Sunday school class called uh, American Gospel. 
Uh, so far, it's been very good. And he said, you know, the gospel comes at a cost sometimes. The obedience to the Bible comes at a cost. Sometimes it's your family. Sometimes it's, your, it's a career. Sometimes it's something that you really like and really love. But do you love Jesus more? When Jesus said to the disciples, man, you've got to hate your family if you're going to follow me. He didn't really truly mean hate them. He said what, in translation, it was basically, you've got to, it, your love for me has to be so high that the love you have for your family looks like hatred in comparison. I'm not telling you to hate your, hate your family when I over here and I told you to love your family, love your neighbor as yourself. Come on, there's no contradiction there. He's saying, love me so much that the love for you have for everybody else looks like hatred. You would follow me no matter what. You turn your back on anything and everything and follow me. And sometimes it can, it, it can, it can be a, a burden. It can be a, a weight to do that, especially if, if we're looking at what other people think and, and what does the world think about me and what, is these, what do these people think about me? And here's the kicker, what do I think about me? We don't have time to analyze all that. In the military, uh, uh, during boot camp and things like that, they don't give time to think. Do it and do it now. Do it and do it now. We're trying to form you and mold you into a, 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 an elite fighting, killing machine in some respects. What makes the blood or what makes the grass grow? Blood, blood, blood. You know, what's that, the Marines or something? Uh, I mean, I don't know who that is. Uh, some crazy men. Uh, but um, uh, obey, obey right away. Jump, how high? Obey, obey right away. No time to analyze. Just obey. People are dying every day and going to hell. Just win souls. We need to get busy obeying and doing what God told us to do. So everybody's going to stand before God, and we're going to be judged, all of us. The lost will be judged at the great white throne judgment, and they'll be judged for their sins. The saved will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ, and we will be judged according to our works and what sort they are. Now, I said a few weeks ago, thank goodness my life it's not going to be put on a big screen, and, my, and I'm not going to, hey, look at all the things Jake did. Whew. Nope, that was taken care of on Calvary. Um, uh, but our works, our works will be tried, not our motives. So works fall into two categories. Temporal, wood, hay, stubble. Eternal, uh, gold, silver, precious stones. They'll last forever, last through eternity, the Bible says. So soul winning is an eternal work. Christians are an eternal work. The church is an eternal work. Those are eternal, eternal things. So I'll tell you tonight, and I know that we've been busy, like Martha, but are we busy about the right things? Are we busy about the right things? Let's try to get busy taking the gospel, taking the good news to the lost, trying to salvage the saved, and the gospel of redemption, the gospel of the cross to the lost, and the gospel of redemption to people who feel like they can't be redeemed. There's all kinds of lost people. You can win people to Christ if we want to. Uh, I didn't have a great day yesterday um, in any wise trying to soul win. And uh, my dad texted me, he said, Hey, how did today go? And I said, Poorly. And he said, Next week. I said, Nah, hang that next week stuff. I've got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So I got seven days a week. Uh, I've got tomorrow I go to Michigan. Tuesday I leave for Mobile, Alabama. Don't want to brag, but it's like 78 down there. Um, uh, I head down to Mobile, Alabama, and uh, there's 861 miles in between Fort Wayne and Mobile, Alabama. There's all kinds of people in between there and here. I'll be stopping a few times. There may be somebody I can give the gospel to. I don't want to wait. Because there's people that can hear it now. Uh, and what's anybody know the rough, the rough numbers uh, on Allen County population? 350? 350,000? 366. 366,000? 366, anybody know what 1% of 366,000 is? 1%? 1%. What, I don't know our, our church record history, but how, do you know off the top of our head how many we have saved in a year, top year? Oh, yeah, we've had 45, 44, 43. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, that message from this morning. Yes, we can. I told my dad today, I was like, did you know that was a Barack Obama slogan? <laughs> He's like, what? I was like, yeah, yes, we can. Hope and change. Uh, give me the hope, keep the change, amen. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. God can use anybody in this room. And God wants to use everybody in this room. He doesn't just want to use somebody. He wants to use everybody. Everybody that says, here, my Lord, send me. Here, my Lord, send me. God, God's like, hey, I got, I got a job for you. It may not be easy. It may be uphill. There may be some, 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 some problems along the way. But I promise you, it's, it's worthwhile. And we can do it. You say, do what? obey. You see, that's all we have to do is obey and let God give the increase. When we obey this book, you know, that's what Three Rivers started off on was obeying the Bible. And man, we went and blossomed like a, like a flower in the sunlight. All we got to do is, and not saying that we've been disobedient, I think our battle has been a unique one um, in, in our fight with the devil and, and the the battles we've had to fight, we now, I don't think we ever stopped obeying. Uh, we've just been in a serious battle. And God is retooling us. Retooling us. And um, he had to purge us and prune us. When a tree gets a disease, if it's not cut out, it can get the whole tree. It can get the whole tree. God had to cut out some disease. And you best believe I'm not letting the disease come back. Because we have learned what to be out on the lookout for, for when we gr start growing again. And we go, that guy back there, that girl back there, that family back there, there's a, a lot of the same similarities as that old disease. Now we know what to look out for. You see, the devil knows you and knows what buttons to push with you, but we can learn from him too. We can learn how he works too and be on guard the next time the lion comes around looking for whom he may devour. So it's not about your motives. Check your motives later. Let's just obey tonight. Let's start obeying from right where we are. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for all that you've done at Three Rivers Baptist Church in 28 years. 28 years. I remember coming here, Lord, as a seven-year-old boy and hauling out scrap drywall for the walls and stuff they were building in the Ted Nugent Tabernacle. <laughs> Lord, I remember the, the bus, the first bus route. I remember then the second and third and fourth and fifth bus routes. I remember the vans. I remember the school. I remember the conferences. I remember souls being saved and baptisms and big days. And Lord, I, I remember all those things. And man, they were a lot of work. But I think that you, you haven't withdrawn, Lord. You're still looking to do those things all over again. You'll do them in Oklahoma. You'll do them in Texas. You'll do them in Chicago, you'll do them. You'll do them anywhere. And I know that you'll do them in Fort Wayne. Lord, Fort Wayne needs a, a powerful church, a, an on fire church, a zealous church, a wise church. And Lord, I, uh, I've never been a, a great speaker or, a Lord, even known how to pray eloquently. And I know the Holy Spirit utters groanings on our behalf that I, I can't even put into words that are coming out of my heart. Sometimes my eyes well up with tears thinking about the possibilities. And Lord, I, I see people walking the aisles again. I see buses rolling in again. And Lord, I can say today my motives are there. I can say my motives are, 
are, I, I believe they're righteous, but my motives do nothing if I am not living in obedience. Heavenly Father, I'd ask that you'd help us. Those who are timid, give them boldness. Those who are backslidden, convict them and help them to confess sin and get it right and, and get right with God. Oh, Heavenly Father, I'd ask that you'd help our church. I'd ask that you'd bless us once again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Heavenly Father, we love you and we need you. I'd ask that you'd bless us this week and help us to see people saved. Help us to be on the lookout for people that want to be saved. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.